Let's get our next guest in the program, though. Joining me now via Skype is Liberal Senator James Patterson. Thanks very much for your time. I want to Thanks start so. with what's just happened, the latest on China. I suppose you'd call it a trade threat at this stage or this investigation into dumping. Um, what's your message as a member of government to those in the wine industry right now? That we very much understand the frustration and concern that they will be feeling uh, and that we share with them bewilderment uh, that this accusation has been made against them because they run a world-class industry. They have a high-quality product. It's sold into China, in fact, at premium prices, far from being dumped. It's the second most expensive international wine sold in China and that we will do everything we can to work with them to assist them to uh, explain to the Chinese government why there is no basis uh, for their anti-dumping concerns. Given the lack of facts behind the claim and what you said there, which we keep hearing, you know, you don't select the Australian wine in China to, to, um, to be a cheapo if you're shouting the meal. Does this show China is essentially abusing its membership of the World Trade Organisation? It's up to China to explain its rationale and to the Chinese government to explain their rationale here because they haven't provided an adequate explanation, in my view, as to why they've singled out Australian wine. As I say, there's no evidence available to us that indicates that uh, these allegations are correct. And it's up to them to explain, if it is without evidence as it appears to be, what their rationale is for this. Sure, it's up to them, but you've seen the lack of rationale so far. You've seen what they've done, for example, on beef and barley. Is this China abusing its role within the WTO? Well, Tom, I don't know specifically about whether it's an abuse of their role in the World Trade Organisation, but I certainly agree that it's not a good faith way to engage uh, with a trading partner, particularly one which you have a free trade agreement with, which has bring, brought great prosperity uh, to both our countries, which has benefited both our countries. Both Chinese consumers and Australian consumers, Chinese exporters and Australian exporters have benefited hugely from this deal. And it's not within the spirit of that agreement or our comprehensive bilateral mm. uh, relationship that you would behave in this way. What can be done, though? Because it's Australia now. It could be other countries that decide to stick their head up, if you like. China was brought into the WTO in 2001. We can see the, the benefits of trade around the world. But is that benefit now being re-evaluated? They still have this stealing of IP. They still don't let other countries in in terms of investment in China. And now they're able to threat or coerce countries via these types of mechanisms? I mean, is it time to reassess how this all works? I think a lot of businesses will be looking at their international trading arrangements and thinking it's time for them to diversify and not to be too dependent on any one country and China in particular, given events like this. And it's up to the government to assist them to do so by opening up as many pathways as possible. Uh, when we came to government, only about a quarter of our international trade was covered by free trade agreements. Right now, that's up to 70%. And if we complete the current negotiations with countries like the United Kingdom and the European Union and others, mm. that will rise up to 90%. So that make that diversification process for Australian businesses so much easier if we can help open those pathways. And we've got an important role to play there. So Joel Fitzgibbon has uh, raised concerns about the latest uh, trade missive. He describes China as a key trading partner. He says it's a big gorilla. We shouldn't be picking a fight and shouldn't have led the call for this inquiry or been within the lead, within the surrounds of that, if you like, on COVID-19. What's your view on that? So these comments by Joel Fritzgibbon are gravely irresponsible and unhelpful. They're unhelpful to Australia's national interest. They're unhelpful to the wine industry, representatives of which have contacted me today about their concerns about his comments. And frankly, they're completely inappropriate and undiplomatic language to use about China. He makes no differentiation between the Chinese people, the Chinese government and the Chinese Communist Party. He just lumps them all in, uh, in uh, to one. And I don't think it's too much to expect an Australian politician to take Australia's side in a trade dispute, particularly when there's so little evidence of any fault on our part as there is in this case. Uh, Richard Miles, be... the shadow... Hmm. So I was just going to say that would it be better um, for the US to be leading the way on these sorts of things, whether it be leadership in our region, or, or, you know, the global push for a COVID inquiry, they have the heft to match China. China hurts it, the US can give it a bloody nose back. For us, it seems to go one way on trade hurt. Well, the United States certainly has an important role to play in upholding the international rules-based order, and we work closely with them on that, but uh, that doesn't really exculpate uh, Dr Fitzgibbon's comments. I mean, Richard Miles said only a, a little over a week ago at the National Press Club that when Labor speaks on China, they will only have one voice. So I think it's up to 
Richard Miles and Penny Wong and Anthony Albanese to clarify, is Joel Finn's mm. given that one voice on China uh, because they're very quick to slap him down when he steps out of line on energy and climate policy. But as yet, I haven't seen any Labor front venture, let alone the Labor leader, distance themselves from these gravely irresponsible comments. There's a report China will make countries recognise the South China Sea there hegemony there, if you like, before supplying the vaccine, if indeed they win the race. Does that make winning the race to a vaccine pretty important? Well, I saw those reports, Tom, and if they are indeed accurate, that is an inappropriate quid pro quo, uh, and certainly not something that Australia or any of our allies would ever do. In fact, as you would have heard yesterday from the Prime Minister in our negotiations uh, about how to secure a vaccine for Australia, we're looking to do everything we can to make it available to our friends and allies in the region who might not be able to be you know, strong as position as Australia to, to seek it. And we'll be doing that uh, out of the goodness of our heart and for the interests of our regional uh, friends and neighbours. We won't be requiring any political quid pro quo from them, certainly not one uh, which transgresses international law as this request from China would. You're living at the moment, finally, in a situation I don't think you could ever have dreamed of. You're in lockdown with curfew in the city of Melbourne. Are you concerned at all about the harsh restrictions? Any element that goes too far unnecessarily? I'm, I'm deeply concerned about it, Tom. It's having an enormous impact on Victorians, on their mental health, on our society, on, our, on their small businesses, on their employment. Uh, I fear that we're going to spend many years picking up the pieces from this period. It's been enormously costly and it's very frustrating that it appears to have come about as a result of a public policy failure, which is the failure to properly run a hotel quarantine in a safe and secure way as other states and territories mm. touch wood so far seem to have been able to have done. Errors that you outlined there by the Victorian government, leaders have gone for a lot less. Should Daniel Andrews, once the height of this crisis has passed, look at stepping down? Look, that's really a matter for him. I'm a federal politician. I'm not going to call for a state politician to step down. That's up to him to search his conscience and decide whether that's the best thing for him to do. Uh, all the federal government can do in the meantime is work with the Victorian government as much as possible to get past mm. this crisis because the federal and government just, governs for all Australians okay. and Victoria is in, Victoria's health is in the national's interest. Just very short on time, but just on, on the restrictions, I know you mentioned the issues that could come for years to come, but do you have any issue with the restrictions themselves or now that Victoria's in this mess, they're, they're necessary? Well, all restrictions that are based on medical advice are appropriate and should be followed. But in the COVID-19 committee today, we heard representatives from the tourism industry say that there doesn't appear to be any medical basis for the restrictions of travel between two states that have no outbreaks of COVID-19, for example, right, Western Australia and Victoria. Queensland. Uh, well, the, the Victorian restrictions are very harsh. There's no question about that. But all we can do is follow the advice of the Chief Health Officer here right. at Brett Sutton. Well, we do hope for, that uh, all the people in Melbourne there can be out of those harsh lockdown measures soon. James Patterson, thanks for your time today. Thank you, Tom.